Hi guys, my name is Andrzej Jaronsik and welcome to Artist with Andy, The Craft of Living. So in one of my earlier videos, I told you a little bit about my story of how one specific factor or element of my conversion experience to Christianity contributed to how I tend to process information, contributed to the kind of questions that I'm generally interested in, and how I like to examine different fields of knowledge and study and human experience to coalesce answers and questions about the art or craft of living. So today I want to talk a little bit more about some of the specific encounters with ideas and thoughts in my life that have had a significant impact on the kind of questions I like to pursue. I mentioned before how as a young Christian I started going to the bookstores and trying to find literature that I could read and that I could um, find inspiration in for my questions about life. And I mentioned at that time that one of the books I found and started reading was a book by Søren Kierkegaard. And here is the copy. It is a Serbian translation of philosophical fragments. And I remember buying this book. I still have the old price that is in there. And I remember opening the book and trying to read this. And when you open the first sentence, at least in this translation, it begins with a provocative claim. And Kierkegaard asks the question, how can or to what degree can truth be taught and learned. And then, of course, he goes expounding on this and what he means by that question. And that I will leave this for some other times. But from early on then in my life, I was really attracted to existentialism, especially to Christian existentialism. Now, I know that existentialism is not in vogue anymore, that that dominant form of thinking that had its heydays in the 1950s and 1960s in post-war, especially Europe. Uh, it's not that popular anymore and people have moved to other sort of types of thinking, sometimes I believe wrongly named postmodern thinking. But in any case, um, I liked the literature because I believe that the question the questions that these people raised, people like Sartre and Camus and people like uh, Søren Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and others, that this isn't really a question of popularity or certain historical periods. I mean, they were examining questions that people have asked for millennia and they just put them into a different sort of language, different emphasis and different historical context. But questions, what, is, what does it mean to be human and what is freedom? What are the contours of human responsibility? How do we discover meaning of life? How do we deal with suffering? How can we affirm the beauty of existence in the face of tragedy? And questions like that, especially in Kierkegaard, the importance of decision, of choice, of being able to decide which path you want to pursue and the costliness of such a choice. I mean, that, those were the kind of questions that people have asked for a very long time. But in any case, for me as a young person, experiencing, encountering existentialist philosophy was really one way in which my interests were shaped. Second, when I was a theology student early on in my studies in my education, I encountered serendipitously the book, The Cost of Discipleship or Simply Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I stumbled upon the book, serendipitously I say, by pure chance in a bookstore in Germany. I didn't know about Bonhoeffer. I didn't know about his life. I didn't know the significance of the book. I remember staying in front of this huge wall of books and praying, actually, to find a book that is good for me, not to waste my money. I was a relatively, you know, theology student with not a lot of money. So, and I remember picking the book by Bonhoeffer and starting to read the first sentence, which says, 
Billige Gnade ist der Todesfeind unserer Kirche. The cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. And, and I thought, well, this is a really book for me. It, and I think there was a reason why I was so attracted to that. First of all, one of the major authors with whom Bonhoeffer dialogues, so dialogue wouldn't, dialogues would not be a good way to put it. One of the authors that stands really behind that book, Cost of Discipleship, is precisely Soren Kierkegaard. And his emphasis on costliness of grace, his attack on Christendom and superficial and hypocritic Christianity. And you see that seeping through Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship. In any case, I bought the book only to realize a little bit later that that was actually a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, which I believe is the charter of the Christian life. I believe that if anyone asks you or if anyone asks me, tell me what is Christianity, responding by saying, well, it is the Sermon on the Mount, that that is not a bad answer at all. So Bonhoeffer was very important to me to communicate a seriousness of faith, to communicate to me the importance of peacemaking and the importance of a radical commitment to Jesus Christ. Uh, the reason why that was important, I think, was also because I kept reading him or started reading him in all earnestness during the war in the former Yugoslavia. And with and he really helped me navigate those times, not to be sucked in by all kinds of ideologies of nationalist intolerance and hatred and all of that. So Bonhoeffer was very important to me. Third, when I moved to South Africa and continued my studies at Hellebrook College, one of the things that had impacted me a lot was encountering Aristotle. My professor John Webster, who at that time was teaching at Hellebrook College, introduced me to Aristotle and to virtue ethics. And it was that introduction that later on uh, really made me embrace the importance of the language of character and formation. And then opened me up down the road to be receptive to literature that was dealing with those kind of questions. And so I became deeply interested in that. And I believe that the whole area of virtue ethics that, as I said, deals with questions such as how, to be, how do we become moral beings rather than how do we just act morally? How can we acquire a character which is marked by integrity and authenticity? What is the role of community in the formation of character? How can the formation of character and the formation of a communal character become a social power and a social witness? What are the practices of moral formation that we can engage in? So from Aristotle, I, from there on, I started reading literature such as Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, Stanley Hauwas's work, who is a significant and important Christian theologian, Christian ethicist, who really developed a type of Christian virtue ethics. And you can see that in this channel, where I'm dealing with the craft of living, where I'm dealing with questions of moral formation and human flourishing, that that kind of influence would have been very important. Fourth, during my master thesis, when I was thinking about what to do, I became uh, really intrigued about this question of conversion. Uh, what is intellectual conversion? What is moral conversion? What is aesthetic conversion? And so I started uh, reading literature and became acquainted with Lawrence Kohlberg's, you know, theory of moral formation and moral development, John Fowler's, Fowler's theory of faith development, uh, James Lauder's work, and different people like that. And it wasn't really any specific model that I embraced. It was more that I wanted to understand the phenomenology, the dynamics of formation, what does it really include, and 
how are these processes of formation connected with our desire to pursue and understand truth? How is conversion related to authenticity? And how is authenticity related to epistemology, to questions of truth and knowledge? Now, those are very interesting questions, and I like to think about them and reflect on them. And again, in the future, I will certainly have a number of videos that explore that essential topic, this relationship between virtue and truth, between character and truth, between having aptitude for truthfulness and acquiring truth. I mean, I think these are incredibly important, especially in an age where truth is so difficult to be had, given the various cultural forces and factors that are contributing to that. And finally, the fifth important influence in bringing together these interests that are at the background of this channel was something that happened to me while doing my graduate studies at the University of Chicago. Uh, one day in one of our classes, a book got assigned. I did not know about the author, but I was intrigued by the title of the book. And the title of the book was Philosophy as a Way of Life, and the author was Pierre Adol. I didn't know at that time, I mean, I realized it when I got this book, that my professor Arnold Davidson actually was instrumental in bringing this book to light in the English translation. And so as I started reading the book, which deals with ancient philosophy, and this whole basic idea how philosophy at that time was conceived as a type of discipleship. Philosophy wasn't something that you just went to a place and then studied information and then you just continued living. No, no, philosophy was really a way of attaching yourself to a teacher that you respected in the desire, with the purpose of discovering what does it mean to live well. Now, of course, different schools of thought approached this very differently, but again, they were very much concerned to encourage and foster and present forms of living that would then qualify for the title, A Well-Lived Life. So I became acquainted more with Stoics and Epicureans. I begin to understand why it was so important for them to practice attentiveness and solitude, why they were so intent on dealing with passions and unruly emotions, and why did they insist so much on living in the present moment? The idea of carpe diem that has been so commercialized and we have all these different, you know, cups and bumper stickers, you know, seize the day. That, that kind of meaning, carpe diem, seize the day, had to do with something quite different. It had to do with this invitation to live in the present moment. As later Johann Wolfgang Goethe this towering figure in German literature and culture said that only the present is our happiness. That was very much present in these ancient thinkers. So understanding these philosophical schools as being a type of therapy and medication of the soul, and then reading of the specific practices they encouraged to develop a life of equanimity and tranquility in the face of suffering, to focus on the important things and kicking out the dross out of life, that was very important. Obviously, I found many commonalities. I started discovering commonalities between these schools in ancient philosophy and other wisdom traditions, including the wisdom aspect and the wisdom tradition aspect of the Judeo-Christian faith. So, these are the five influences then that have shaped me. Number one, the exposure to existentialism. Number two, my encounter with Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the Sermon on the Mount and importance of peacemaking and discipleship. Number three, virtue ethics with its emphasis on character and the questions of what is happiness and what is the good life. Number four, interest in the dynamics 
and processes and phenomenology of conversion and how do conversion experiences happen. And number five, my encounter with ancient philosophy, with its stress on the therapy of the soul and an array of strategies and practices that they commended, which I found find to be very helpful and which I certainly will be expounding on in the future. Well, thanks again so much for today. Thank you for listening to this video and for taking a look at this channel. Uh, this is Artis Vendi, The Craft of Living. Live well, stay strong, and peace to you.